<laughs> Thank you. And James, thanks for sharing your testimony. That's what we're all about in these meetings here. We have one every night, and, and it's pretty hard to follow that up because I'm so edified by it. <laughs> it makes it difficult to follow up. Anyways, good to be here. I had some friends back here, Robert and Zen and company. They made me have curvy, curry this afternoon. They forced me to do all these things that I really don't normally know. <laughs> and then Zed, Zen had me eating habanero peppers again. So I'm sucking wind. <laughs> yeah. And then, we, have, of course, everybody's feeding me. And Rosalie and Carl back here, Needham, they had me eating sandwiches that night before I went over there. So I didn't want to tell you guys that, but <laughs> it's continual. Thank you for your hospitality. I'm enjoying it. Anyways, I want to do a quick little review of where we've been going in this series here. What I decided to do here is to go a lot deeper into what happened at the cross. Like I've told you, it's been a, a passionate, one of, the, one of the topics that I'm passionate about studying for quite a year, quite a few years now. And, um, and there's so much more I discovered by just digging little innuendos and little inferences and tiny little details and you put them all together and all of a sudden a picture emerges that blows your mind. Because I've always just sort of thought, well, Jesus came down. Yeah, it's a big sacrifice. Hangs in you for 33 years. Had a pretty tough, tough death. Goes back to heaven. Everything's back to normal. And I have an opportunity to go to heaven. And that's, that would be good if it was. But the bowl goes a whole lot more than that. In quick review... We started out with looking at the robes of Jesus. When I realized that Jesus went through an unusually large amount of robe changes, especially after his resurrection, or it's not resurrection, sorry, his arrest. And then we start all these robe changes, and it hit me. Those mean something. Every one of them. And what those robes mean, I just want to bring this point out in review here, is it tells you how far Jesus went. It's the, it's the element that actually lets you know what is going on internally with him. What is the level of sacrifice he's going through by just simply looking at the robes? Before I get it, go, I just got to pray. Father God, we just come before you again. This is a topic about what you did and what your son did on Calvary. It's absolutely important because it's the, it's the turning point in the whole history of the universe. And we just want to thank you, Father, for being the kind of God you are, for giving us scripture with all the evidence we need to understand. It's just a matter of calling down the Holy Spirit to be the tutor and dig in and do it. Jesus, we just want to elevate you and address you as you deserve to be addressed. You suffered so much, you went so far, and it hasn't ended. It's that way for eternity, and we want to thank you for that. Because we'll be able to spend eternity with you just marveling what level of sacrifice you went through for us. Satan, I know you're going to want to be here to try to distract and destroy. I command you again in the name of Jesus. And by the power and the blood that he spilled on Calvary, get lost. You don't have any right to be here because this is a closed meeting between ourselves and our Father God. Holy Spirit, fill that void with, with your role now to teach and to interpret. I present this in the name of Jesus. So the robes, we start out with what robe? Jesus' right, righteous robe. And how do we know that it's righteous? Because it's without seam and it's white linen. So why would he have the opportunity to wear that robe? Well, it's because he was righteous. He never sinned. So he could legitimately wear that robe of righteousness. And so we see him in that and we're all content. Yes, that's the way it should be. Then he gets arrested. And they take him to trial. They take that robe off of him and throw on a kind of a controversy on the colors. It, was it a blue robe? I mean, a purple robe like uh, Mark and John say? Or was it a scarlet red robe like Matthew says? How could they get cut, mixed up in the colors? Well, when you look at two colors, both those colors belong to Satan. And that's the colors of Babylon and the Hur of Babylon. Red and purple. And we looked at colors. We looked at what they mean. God is a color blue. Satan is a color red. So where does purple come from? You blend the two, you wind up with purple. You blend God's color with Satan's color. You get an intermediate color, purple. Now if you parallel that with what you see in Revelation 3, 14 to 17 about Laodicea, you see cold water, you see hot water, and you see the blending of the two, lukewarm. And there is where we 
find out beyond any shadow of a doubt that Satan controls and owns the red, the cold, the purple, and the lukewarm. And God only gets one color, that's blue, and one temperature, that's hot. So when that robe is taken off, Jesus' robe of righteousness, and they put it on, uh, and they put on him one of a satanic robe. We also talked about what robes mean. It's your identity. Throughout the Bible, whatever you wear identifies who you are. So now all of a sudden we get a satanic robe put on Jesus. What could that mean? It's shocking. Because when he took my sins, that's what he deserved to wear. Because that's how completely he took my sins. But the robe changes don't end there. They take that robe off from him. In the interim, the whole time, in that whole trial there, they beat him mercilessly. They put a crown of thorns on him to have him bleeding down his face and forehead. And they put his own robe back on him again. Now what would that mean? Now he trudges up to Calvary and that robe becomes blood-soaked. When he reaches Calvary, the robe changes aren't over. They take that robe off him again. That robe that represents the penalty for wearing that Red or purple robe, purple robe. The penalty for wearing that, blood has to be shed. The wages of sin is death. So the robe of, that, that his robe of righteousness is now soaked in blood is taken off him. And where does it end up? In the hands of sinful man. But it's not ripped up like normal robes that prisoners take and turn into rags. They, they cast lots over that one to keep it together. I'm glad they did because in the end we see that same robe again. Robe changes aren't finished. We now have a state of non-robe. They take his robe off, put him on the cross naked, nail him to the tree, as Roman custom is. And now he's got a state. What would that mean when he has no robe whatsoever? If you realize that the the robes are what your identity is, when you have no robe, you have no identity. And we recognize that it means you're desolate, you're you're nobody wants you, you're in the junk, junk heap of society. And that's where Jesus was. Dying alone on that cross. Remember we talked about he is rejected from his father. Father, my God, my God, where, why have you forsaken me? He was rejected by his disciples. They all fled. And he's rejected by all his closest family because they're all standing afar off while he's dying alone. He finally dies. Another robe. And we looked at that little brain hiccup that Mark has in Mark 14 where a young man comes running covered in a cloth. They grab the cloth, he runs away naked. And we'll review that one because we're going to get back into that particular situation and tonight add, an, add that into tonight's lecture as well because I mentioned before that we're going to cover this little detail later. But the point is, that, rope, that fabric that came off marks the one he featured there where he runs away naked. We find Jesus naked and what's put on him. The very same Greek word, the same thing, cloth, sindon, is put on Jesus now in the tomb. What does that mean? We went through that a little bit. Certainly it means this much. That cloth came from, as well as the anointing by, by the hooker, in the beginning of that same chapter, Mark 14, the anointing for Jesus' burial by the hooker. Remember we talked about anointings. Only people of high spiritual status anoint people of low status to become great people. Now you have someone of super low status anointing someone of high status, Jesus. Where can that take him? Only down. And then he gets put on him as his grave clothes. The same, the same Greek word, cloth, that the young man ran away and he was naked and Jesus was found naked and the fabric is put on him. Meaning he's clothed in humanity. And what I did get through when we, the other night about that one is when Jesus is closed in humanity and God looks down in the tomb, we have a problem. And I'll address that a little more again tonight. The problem is this. We have a big cause and effect out there. It's the wages of sin is death. So if you sin or if you end, end your life here in a state of sin, Death is your result, and that death is the second death. There is no resurrection from the second death. Jesus died infiltrated with my sin. How is it possible that he was resurrected when he had my sins in him? He became my sins. It's only because he was clothed in a robe of humanity So at that point in the tomb, there's a human corpse laying there, covered in a robe of humanity that came from humanity. 
But now is where it gets good. Jesus didn't sin. And so if Jesus dies for all of humanity, which he did, all of humanity, if he remains human, that means his own sacrifice covers for him as a human. And God looks down on that tomb. Can he resurrect him? No, you're not allowed to because you have to die the second death. Except for he sees a human robe. He sees a human robe there in the tomb and he sees perfection around it because Jesus never sinned. And so Jesus went into that tomb as one of Satan's own. That's the tragedy of wearing that red or was it purple robe. He, he became one of Satan's own. Satan got his greatest wish, I want to be like the Most High. God was so unfair in the great controversy, let him have his wish. And now he's in the tomb. God looks in there. He has no right to resurrect enemy except he sees human robe. And his own son died, which would cover for him as a human. And he's able to say, arise. And the tomb explodes. And Jesus comes forth. Robes aren't over yet. What do we see Jesus wearing in the next 40 days? He's wearing a plain old robe. Not his robe of righteousness anymore. That's not featured anymore. He's robing a, wearing a plain old robe. And how do we know it's plain? Well, because Mary didn't recognize him at the tomb. The two guys to Emmaus didn't recognize him when they were walking there. They would have if they'd recognized that very unusual robe that's without seam. And the fishermen, when they're in the boat, they don't recognize him. He's just wearing a plain old robe, nothing fancy. And then we see him at his ascension. He goes into heaven and we're given a text that says, as you see him go up, so he'll come back. Oh, one other point. So right after the tomb, he tells Mary, don't touch me because i got to go to my father. And yet a little while later, he says, Thomas, go ahead, touch me. So it's my belief and a lot of theologians' belief that at that point Jesus goes up, check in, comes back down. He goes up as a human, comes back as a human. So he's been in heaven, comes back as a human. Now he's at his ascension where he's going to go to heaven. And the, and, the, and the promise is given, as you see him go up, you will see him come back. Now remember we looked at that. That can mean one of two things. As you see him go into the sky, you'll see him come back out of the sky. Or we can say, as you see him go up as a human, he'll come back as a human. And then we want to know, how long is this going to last? Is it going to be 33 years and everything's back to normal for Jesus? We want to know how long will it last. Well, then we go to Revelation 19, and what we see there is Jesus goes on forever wearing a robe soaked in blood so that we can wear robes perfect, white, and clean. Because Jesus has been trading places at every single move during his time here. Everything is trading places, trading places. And a couple of trading places we went through. Number one, Jesus comes in the world as what? The Son of God. He goes out as the Son of Man. We come in as sons and daughters of men and go out as sons and daughters of God. Massive trading places. Jesus comes in, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He, goes, he becomes the first begotten of many. Trading places again, so we, we have the opportunity to join him in his family. He goes from an only child to one of many. Absolutely fantastic. And the trading places go on and on and on with Jesus. So if he's gonna trade places and we have access to heaven, what do you think that trading place would be? Up so that we can go up? No, he's gonna go down so we can go up. And when we see him with that robe, in Revelation 19, a blood-soaked robe riding a horse while we all ride horses with pure white robes, white and clean. That's an eternal sacrifice Jesus made. And this is why we need to look into how far did he go because when you understand how far you go, far he went, it blows our mind. It leads us to want him. So where are we going to go tonight? Jesus beneath his father? Probably is a question mark. And we'll do, let's start here. Jesus receives from the one he was once equal to. Now what I want to do here tonight, just so you know, like I said the other night, the last couple nights, 
This is a Reader's Digest edition, so if there's any holes, come and talk to me, okay? Because I've got, on this topic alone, I, have, I looked at it again today in my computer, 41 pages of scriptural references and comments pointing me to where this is going. 41 pages, single space in Word, in Microsoft Word. So we're not getting much here, but I'm picking out some text that should give us the direction. Where I want to go tonight is, is um, if, Jesus re- if Jesus went back to heaven and became divine, just like everything was before, then everything about his Father is going to be about him as well. Because John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's happened now? So if we're going to look at texts that say, if God has to give him something after his resurrection, then it means that he must be in a position different. Remember, was it last week we talked about... Um, Where did Jesus go when he went back to heaven? Yeah, I think it was last night, right? He went to the right hand of God. 21 verses in the New Testament saying that Jesus went to the right hand of his Father. Well, what does that mean? We looked at a bunch of Bible references that said right hand in the Bible doesn't mean equal to, it means subservient to, but it means an elevated position. So Jesus was at an elevated position. So now we're going to look at a few texts here that let us know uh, did he have to receive anything? If he has to receive any, then that means he isn't where he started. Philippians 2, 8, 9. And being found in the fashion as a man, okay, we get that, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name. If Jesus is exalted, now here's the points I kind of want to make. We're going to go through a lot of scripture here. But if Jesus is exalted, that means somebody is offering him something to bring him up to some level. If he went right to back to the position he had from before he came to this earth, he would be that. He wouldn't need to be given that. You see what I mean? And we'll go through a lot more here. Acts 2, 32 to 36. This Jesus got... This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Now this is interesting. Before Jesus came to this earth, where was he in position to God and the Holy Spirit? Equal. So now he's at a position where he's given the Holy Spirit, which he was once equal to. What does that mean? That means he'd have to be down a ways to be given something that he was once equal to. I'm not demeaning Jesus here. And I know maybe some of you, I should read a disclaimer that all the content shared here at these meetings are, uh, may may not reflect the views, Justin, I don't want to get you in trouble, so it may not reflect the views of Justin or whoever else. But anyways, but this is biblical, I'm I'm just, we're just going to the Bible. So the point is, is Jesus is both exalted and he's given the Holy Spirit, of which he was exaltation before, and he was equal with the Holy Spirit. See where I'm going? Another one. Mediator, Jesus between us and God, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What? The divine person, Jesus? No, it's the man Christ Jesus. And he's a mediator. So mediator. So where is Jesus located? He's located somewhere between God and us. And we've and we look at a lot of texts last time. He's at the right hand of God, which would be somewhere between God and us. Romans eight thirty four. It is Christ that died, yea rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So. If Jesus was at the level he was before he came to this earth, he wouldn't need to be intercessing with God. He would be the one that needs to have an intercess between us and him. Does that make sense? It is Christ that died, yea, rather... Oh, I, there we go. Oh, I guess I'm pointing out that should be pointing this. Romans eight thirty four. There we go. John eight twenty eight. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Jesus is telling us. I mean, whether it's before or after, everything has remained the same because we looked at the robes. Whose glory? Now let's look at a few texts about that. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So where does this glory come from? That's what we're going to look at now. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father 
with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Jesus comes in the glory of his Father. If he would have been the same as it was before, his, before he came to this earth, he'd be coming in his own glory. I'm not demeaning him. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. Mark 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sin sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and holy angels. Just another text because it's, there's plenty of these things. Jesus is glorified again. For whosoever is ashamed of me... Ah, okay. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not, was not yet glorified. So we just read a bit ago that Jesus was given the Holy Spirit and he was given exaltation and glory. So let's have a look at the next one here. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. But Jesus answered them saying that the hour is come. Man, sorry about that. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Okay, this is what I want to make point here. Okay, so God is glorifying Jesus, but where else does Jesus get glory from? It's from us. He gets the glory from us. I am glorified in them. So when we represent him, not only is God given Jesus elevation, but our lives reflect that and give him glory and elevation. Okay, the Father is in Jesus. Believest now thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. I just brought a few texts out from the other night just to show us that, that Jesus was totally dependent on his Father. If, if he was the way and the state he was before he came to this earth, guess what? He wouldn't need to be dependent on anybody else. He would be independent in terms of giving all these things. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now here's what's really cool. Jesus is saying that I'm in my Father, and my Father in me. But I'm offering you the same thing I have with him. Isn't that beautiful? We have the same opportunity. And that's why when he says in John 14, you'll do greater things than I will, how is that possible? Well, if he's in us and we're in him, just like he was in his Father and the Father in him doing all these great works, Jesus can do whatever he wants. Furthermore, Jesus can offer more options for us because he already paid the price and defeated Satan. So he can legitimately do anything he wants through us. At that, that <clears throat> we are one with God and Jesus, but certainly we aren't divine. Okay, I want to bring a few points out about this. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So Jesus is offering this opportunity, the same connection he had with his Father, he's offering that to us. He's offering for us to have this connection. But we talked about last night, I believe it was, this marriage connection. We have Jesus marrying Israel, I mean God marrying Israel, divine marrying humanity ends in divorce. And then we talk about Jesus all the way, the allegory, all the way through the New Testament where Jesus is the bridegroom and we're the bride. So there's going to be another marriage. And we looked at some references about that. Another marriage. But if we look at the biblical, uh, you know, biblical way that marriage has to work, you leave your parents, you join together, you're a separate entity. You still have connection. Jesus had absolute connection with his father because he said, the works that I do are my father's. The words that I speak are my father's. The father is greater than Jesus. Here's a text. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Because I said I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Before the cross, before Jesus came to this earth, where was Jesus positioned? Equal? Now we have a text like this. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm just showing scripture. Jesus is exalted by the Father and given a name. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. We'll stop right there. If Jesus went back to where he was, nobody needs to give him a name. He becomes the name. But now he's given a name and he's exalted. 
He was exaltation and he had a name. Now it's given to him. Carrying on. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way that one ends. God cannot be tempted. Here's another. I'm just throwing all these little uh, small little things that point to the same thing. And there's, like I said, there's pages and pages of scripture that says this. James 1, 12, 13. Blessed are the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anybody else. Can God be tempted according to this? Apparently not. So let's see what happens. Oh, Jesus was tempted. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. So one text says that God can't be tempted, and the other one says Jesus is tempted. So what does that tell you? He must have moved from the position he was before. God raised Jesus, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now here's another point. Is God immortal? God is immortal. Immortal. Means he can't die. Well, if Jesus would have remained what he was before, how did he die? I mean, these are all just little, not brain teasers, but little text you just dig out and it points to something amazing. Jesus receives rather than is. Okay, I'll explain what I mean in a minute here. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. If Jesus went back to where he was before he came to this earth again, why would he need to be appointed a position above everybody else? He would be there. First Peter 3.22 Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authority and powers being made subject unto him. So somebody is pointing authority, somebody is giving authority, God has given authority to Jesus and appointing rulership over someone else. That means he's, he's being, his life is being car carried on by someone else, God. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now here's the thing, and I brought this up, my wife might be watching, if she is, can you block it out so you didn't see it? No. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. So something is given to Jesus. Now, in my case, I'm married, we're one. Do I give my wife money that is jointly hers? No, but God has given Jesus power. Tells you something. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Remember we talked about that trading places? How long does that Son of Man status stay there? Well, we're going to get into that. Jesus given authority, which he once was authority itself. See what I'm saying? If he had gone back to the way it was before. And sorry, I, I, I probably got too many of these here. But I just want to make sure you get a full understanding of where Jesus is from now on. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son of Man also himself be subjected unto him that put all things under him. Jesus is subjected to his Father, and the Father is the one who puts everything under him. If he was equal to God at this point, like I mean in the same position he was before, he would be that. He wouldn't need to be subjected to it. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, now this is what's interesting, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, that is the devil. 
Now let's just look at the words here. It says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. What does that mean? I hate to say it, that means a sinful nature. And then it says, he also himself likewise. You know how redundant that statement is? There are four statements that say the same thing to make sure we understand that Jesus has the same thing we have. Now a couple of quotes. I was hanging out with, with uh, my friends back here, Carl, today. He brought this one up to me, so I threw it in here quick because I got another one. But here it is, a couple of quotes from The Desire of Ages, page 25. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family. Now get this, forever to retain his human nature. So we see what happened when Jesus was here on the earth and now we see, which the scripture has been saying for the last 20 minutes, we see that forever to retain his human nature. And it says God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heavens. So if, if God appoints Jesus to his right hand, if Jesus rises that, it's telling us that human nature goes up to that position with him, to the right hand of God. Now here's another quote. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in the garden. So what this is saying, even if, God, even if Jesus would have come down, when Adam was there before he sinned, that would be a huge demotion. That would be a big demotion. Now look what it says. But Jesus accepted humility when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. That means there's been degradation from the time sin started in the Garden of Eden 4,000 years of degradation. Is Jesus going to come in at Adam's state when before sin entered? No. Is he going to come in at Adam's state just after they ate the fruit? No. He's going to take the state of a 4,000 year degenerate person. <clears throat> so he takes it for Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. Meaning, when Jesus came down to this earth, he inherited everything that state at that time. That is shocking. All the scripture has been telling us that here, but here we're reading it in, this, in, in the Desire of Ages. What these results were, were is shown in the history of the earth, earthly ancestors. He came with such a hereditary, heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. Now how could he give us example, how could Jesus give an example of sinless life if he carried divinity around his back pocket. He had to have the sinful nature, like this is sin, like these other texts are sin. He had to have the sinful nature in order to prove, be an example of a sinless life. Do you get it? If he had a big advantage over us, if he's carrying around a backpack full of divinity, and he's tempted and he can say, oh, let me just tap into some of that so I can get through this and I can refute this temptation by Satan. Would that be fair to us? No, it'd be a fraud. God is unfair in the great controversy, unfair to his own cause. He is fair, of course, but I mean, he's unfair to his own cause. Okay, moving on here. Equally shared by Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to heaven, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. I don't know why I threw that one in there. <clears throat> now here's the million dollar question. Now we're going to start to get into probably, I just, I'm sorry, I plastered you with so many texts. But I want you to understand that I'm not just taking an errant text out of context and throwing it out there and trying to prove a point. The Bible is full of it. I got a lot more to these, but that would really get fatiguing. What is the single most monumental sacrifice that heaven could ever have made in return for my liberation from the sin-induced death sentence? Let me read it again. I know it's a wordy sentence. Sir. What is the single most monumental sacrifice that heaven could ever have made in return for my liberation from the sin-induced death sentence I have? Well, what do you think would be the greatest sacrifice God could ever do, and would he do it? Would God give up one of the members of the Trinity 
in exchange for me? Does God love me that much? So it would now be a duality of character. I'm not saying that. I'm just asking a question here. That would be a major sacrifice. I think God would do it. But here's the point. Would it not be the eternal death of one of the members of the Godhead? That's what I said. Being totally other-centered, God, could God and Jesus love that much to endure that level of sacrifice? I know the MO of God enough to say he would do that. Now, did he? Fortunately, that is not what happened. But would God have done it? Yeah, I know he would have. But it is deadly close to that scenario. Let's go back to the tomb and the robe of grave cloths. Like I said a couple, three nights ago that we'll cover that a little bit later. Here we are. What about the grave cloth? Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher and stooping down he beheld the linen cloths laid by themselves and departed wondering to himself at that which had come to pass. How many cloths, pieces of cloth? Plural. More than one there. Interesting. Why more than one? That bugged me for several years, to be honest. Here's another text. And seeing two angels in white, in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laying. So we have plural on the cloth, and now we have two angels. Why two angels, one at the head, one at the tail, or one at the feet? Why two groups of cloth? Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloth where the linen, linen cloth lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Have you ever thought about that? Why, why the two piles of clothes? Well, here's the point. What did we just discover in our study of the robes? And I just mentioned in a review here. The robe that came off the guy in Peter's story, sorry, in Mark's story, was wrapped around Jesus, the piece of cloth as the grave cloth around his body. But there was another piece of cloth wrapped around Jesus' head. The piece of the linen around his body represented humanity. Remember, he's anointed by a prostitute. And then he was given fabric in the same chapter off somebody, maybe not the exact piece, but symbolically off a human. That part of the grave cloth, that linen cloth, is the humanity part of it. So what could the other piece, the napkin, what could that represent? We talked last night, I believe it was last night, about the dual lineage of Jesus. What's the dual lineage? The sinful natured person that Mary brought to the package, and then God, dual natured, or not dual natured, dual lineage, by lineage. We've got those two things. We see Jesus' body wrapped in the cloth that came from humanity. What could the other cloth mean? How about divinity? How about divinity? Why the two angels watching over that? Why is everything folded up nice and neat and set apart? Something significant about it has to be. Why is it even mentioned? Who would remember detail like that? If I looked into a tomb and I saw piles of cloth, I'd probably run the other way. Not really, because my father-in-law is a funeral director and I helped with lots of bodies, so that's not a problem anymore. But the point is, is nobody's going to look around and say, oh, by the way, there were two piles of clothes. And then one source says, well, there's two angels. And so what does it all mean? When you look at it in, in, in lieu of, or in, in, under the light of, the fact that robes mean something, there's two parts of Jesus there in that tomb. What part was it that allowed him to be resurrected? It was the human part. So what happened to the other part? We're going to review what we had a few nights ago. The robe of humanity. A young man covered in cloth becomes naked. The very next day, Jesus found naked becomes covered in cloth. Jesus' body enters the tomb. He's one of Satan's lost as he became my sin. Do you agree with that? 
If he became my sin, of course he would be. And it's not demeaning him. That's elevating him. Remember the first night, I think it was, I talked about what would you have more gratitude for somebody who gave you a kidney if you needed a kidney or somebody who offered to drive you to dialysis? The greater the sacrifice, the greater the gratitude. He was anointed by a cultural defying lowly sinner. When I say culturally defining, a prostitute woman was anointing Jesus. How in the world could she be qualified to do that? That would just be disastrous, especially in that culture. And then... The robe he now wears, grave cloth, a linen sheet from a human body covering him in humanity. Now where is it going? Now what is going to happen? We have a serious dilemma. I just reviewed that a bit ago, but I want to point this out at this point. The wages of sin is death. That's the second death. If Jesus took full blame for my sin and thus became one of Satan's own, he had to die the second death. But unfortunately, if Jesus died the second death, there cannot be a resurrection. Unless two groups of cloth, white linen, sinned on, signifying the humanity part of Jesus by lineage. What about the, nap the napkin on Jesus' head? Could it represent the other line of Jesus' lineage? That of his divine side. After all, it was from his head and the other cloth was from his body. The most serious question ever asked right now. We're getting near the end, so sorry. I just plastered a lot of reference out here tonight, but we need to understand this because it's very easy to think, oh yeah, well he's tricking us with a few tricky questions or texts, no. The most serious question ever asked, was the wages of sin is death and it's second death. So that, that package goes, that wages of sin is death, the second death. Was the wages of sin of death and it's second death fulfilled by the death of Jesus' divinity? In which case, we'd be witness to the greatest loss in the history of the universe. I'm asking a question. I'm not going to give you the answer. We've given enough information for you to conclude. Because I'd like to stay here until we leave Sunday. <laughs> here we go. Here's the magnificent news. Whatever happened there, and it says in Desire of Ages that the humanity that Jesus took went all the way through forever, it says, as well as to the highest points of heaven. Humanity, Jesus in that state. So just think it, out, think, think it over. We have a forever living, wonderful Savior who can't wait to spend an eternity with, his, with, his, with us, his fellow brothers and sisters. So here we have... A Savior that has given up something permanently. I've given you piles of texts here to tell you tonight that he didn't have the same status he had before he came down to this earth. Is that demeaning to him? No, if you look at it, it's like, how could you do that? I can't fathom that kind of an offering, that kind of a sacrifice. You see what I'm talking about? It's it's. it's you can't fathom it. Okay, before the cross. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Before the cross, where was he in terms of the angels that he created? Lower. After the cross, Hebrews 1, 3, and 4. When he had made, or when he, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Since Jesus originally created angels, how much higher would he be if he had resumed his once full divinity with God? This says he's made much better than the angels. If Jesus went back to the same position he had before he came to this earth... How much better would he, would he be? Much better than the angels? No, he created them. He created the angels. You wouldn't even want to make a comparison. It's like, am I much better than a birdhouse I built? Yeah. First Peter 3.22 who has gone into heaven and, on, and, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. All these things about 
he and being elevated now above the angels and, and having this authority and everything was given to him. He was exalted. He was glorified. It was given to him by God, which means if everything would remain the way it was before he came to this earth, he would be all those things. He would be all those things. Yeah, I brought this up. Isn't it about time to have a hallelujah chorus? Amen. And here's where we're going to see that. It's time to shout worthy. I love this text in Revelation 5. It says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. I mean, it's in the Messiah. It's in the song we worthy as the Lamb. Other, it's just fantastic, the song we sang the other night. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now, have you ever seen fish give glory? I fish for fish. I've never seen it. Have you ever seen trees quivering in glory? Never seen that. Have you ever seen ever creatures in awe of God? Never seen that. But when we get to heaven, something will have happened to create such a scene that even nature itself it can't contain itself. Now if Jesus just came to this earth and took my place and had a kind of a miserable death, and like I said the other night, not as bad as many of the martyrs in Fox Book of Martyrs, many of the martyrs in the Dark Ages had way worse physical deaths than Jesus had. If he just came down and did that, would we be praising at that level? Forever. You know what our biggest problem is going to be in heaven? Oxygen. Lung capacity. Why? Because we can't get enough air in our lungs to vent that kind of praise. It's like being held underwater until you think you're dead and then somebody pulls you back up. That big gasp you have. Those are the kind of gasps we're going to have for the sole reason of venting praise. Now something monumental will have happened to cause us to do that forever. A miserable death that a lot of humans have had wouldn't do that. But if we see Jesus, the scarred hand still there, we see him in human form, as the desire of ages said, and all these texts say, we see him riding with the robe soaked in blood forever. We won't get enough air in our lungs to vent our praise for looking at him. And here's another cool thing about the whole thing. Several places in the Bible it says this. We won't need a sun in heaven. Why? Because God's glory is going to be the light. And the other neat thing is we'll never have nights in heaven. Now if you put two and two together, i got a whole series I do on what, hap you know, what happened or, or, or what is heaven all about from a scientific standpoint. It's pretty interesting. But, so the point is that we'll have no light, or, or sorry, we won't need the sun in heaven, but we'll have light, the glory of God, and there will be no more nights there. So if there's no nights, how long are we going to have light? Perpetually. What does that light mean? We're basking in the glory of God no matter where we are in the universe. Isn't that a cool thought? And as we're basking in the light, as we're, going, as we're traveling anywhere in the universe, and we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, which has allowed us to be there and bask in the glory of God forever, That'll be our big problem. Not enough air. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for giving us so much scripture. Giving us the Holy Spirit to let us see it. I pray now, Father, as we go from this place that we'll contemplate the level of sacrifice you would make. Burn it into our heart. Rip our heart out if you need to. We want to see it. We want to feel it. We want to be drawn to you because of the love and the compassion that you gave us. Father, you hurt. You had your heart ripped out 
All of heaven had its heart ripped out when Jesus went through this awful chain of events which is going to go on forever. He's elevated. He's at your right hand. But it's a sacrifice we can't comprehend. Jesus, I love you. I give myself to you. And I'm sure everybody here wants to do the same thing. I present this petition in your name. Amen.